Something we need to thank God for is choirs like the Perry Hall uh, High School Gospel Choir. That's a pretty amazing, huh? Well, as I was uh, getting ready for, the, for this sermon, I thought about last week when I was preparing for Debbie's birthday, and, and during that time of preparing for celebrating her birthday, I thought about her influence on me over the years. Can't live 43 years with somebody without a little bit rubbing off. And uh, I realized that she did so many things that helped me become the Christian that I am and the minister that I am. One of the things she taught me was how to fight fair. My family would always lie or run from conflict, and so I was not prepared for mature relationships. She's also sensitive to the atmosphere around me and sometimes points to me, me out, you know, maybe you need to give a little attention to that person or that uh, issue, uh, and that's been very helpful to me. She also helps me with my sermons a lot. I mean, the, uh, so many of my sermons are actually a joint effort, and uh, she just doesn't get the credit. Much of who I am is because of her influence, but as it turns out, it's not just her. It's true for all of us that we, who we are as Christian people, is influenced by many other people who pour into our lives. It's not just what God does with us individually. It's what God does through the community of the church. So my, my whole conception of, of prayer and the importance of prayer was shaped by my InterVarsity staff member back in the 1970s. And it was modeled for me by the by leaders in the Penile Bible Conference. The way I study scripture not only came through InterVarsity leadership, but through seminary professors at Gordon-Conwell. My burden for the city is something that was shared with me early in my life and then reinforced through relationships here at Central and with other pastors who are here in the Baltimore region. Who I am, who any of us are as Christ followers, as ministers, as servants of Christ, is, is partially a group effort as we influence each other. And that's because we're all in this together. Israel heard this message 3,500 years ago as they were facing a major transition, going into a new land. And I want to read to you a section from that. It's out of a long sermon that we find in Deuteronomy, and we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 15. In this series, we're mining this sermon for insights about what it means for us to be always living in times of transition. Deuteronomy 15, and I'll read 15 verses. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it's to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they've made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your fellow Israelite owes you. However, there need be no poor people among you, for in the land the Lord your God has given you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If you only will fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all the commands I'm giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he's promised, and you will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. 
give generously to them. And do so without a grudging heart, because then all, because of this, then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in their land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, don't send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. The situation of this tribe is not that different than the way we face much of life, which is preparing for what's next, and that's what they were doing. Last week, as we were looking about how we prepare our lives as disciples for the challenges God gives us personally and as a body together in the future, we focused on a key question, and that key question was, how are you spending time with Jesus? We're focusing in on a different question today, and that is, how am I getting deeper? How am I connecting more deeply with God's people? Amazingly, for this contemporary question we have, we can also get insight from a sermon preached 3,500 years ago. Now, the particular part we read today has to do with economic disparities, with preventing these, ex, these economic disparities from getting so large that it ruined the hopes of a family for generation after generation. There were limits put on. Some people would be smarter than others. Some people would be wiser. Some would be lazy. Inevitably, some people would become richer. Some would be poorer. Some would get into such difficult trouble that they would even be forced to sell themselves into bond slavery. It's an ugly reality. Nobody was promising a utopia here, that everybody was always going to be doing well. But what is laid out here is a principle that would allow people to recover from their mistakes. It's the principle of grace in people's lives. And that was written into the very way they were supposed to live together. You might bet the farm on a bad decision, but a time comes and the debt is released. Every seven years, the ground would be allowed to rest. Every seven years, debts between people would be canceled. Every seven years, slaves would be freed. Every seven years, there was a restart, a recalibration. As it says in verse 2, the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. Now, these were rules for Israelites. Most of the foreigners in their community would have been merchants, would have been well-off. If they, these foreigners were uh, uh, received into the community, then they were supposed to be treated like brothers and sisters. The point is, within Israel, there was always grace available. There was always capacity for a new start because they were all in it together. They needed each other, and they owed each other a certain amount of grace and love and respect. And verse 4 talks about the vision for this kind of living. He says, there need be no poor people among you, for in this land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance. He will richly bless you. Now, there's a ton of wisdom here about economics and justice issues. The practice of filing back bankruptcy has roots in passages like this. Particularly after we read the New Testament, we need to understand that in a world where there is neither uh, male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, when we see a passage like this and a passage like that in the New Testament, we are reminded that enslaving people for life, enslaving people because of their race, 
Enslavement in concept is inexcusable. And yet we have to recognize that in the history of the church, we've so often been the slave owners and the oppressors. And so if we're going to be living into the kind of relationships we're supposed to model before the world, we've got to be really careful because we haven't always been good at it. But we're all in it together. We're brothers and sisters called from the same history of slavery to sin, called to the same freedom given by God. And this was true for Israel then. It comes out in verse 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. Now the church is very different than Israel. We're not a a earthly nation. We don't own territory and set up our own taxes and economies. We're a heavenly nation that's spread out among earthly nations as salt and light. But as we're scattered, we're all in this together, and we owe each other love and respect, and we need each other. And so I'd like to look at that a little bit as we envision the kind of relationships we need to have. Let's look at it first through the lens of the fact that we need each other. Deuteronomy 15 focuses primarily on finances. But our need for each other in the church is much broader than that. We need teachers. We need musicians. We need people who plan things. We need small group leaders. We need a spiritual friend who knows us and loves us and knows what it means to walk with Jesus because they're on the same journey. We need people like that along our journey. We're all in this together. So how are you going deeper with God's people? Have you made time for it? Time for the spiritual friend, time for the small group. Making time is going to be one of the biggest barriers towards your relationship with other people and your growth as a Christ follower. Let's take a look at this the other way in terms of what we owe each other in terms of love and respect. We're called to reflect the values of a heavenly nation. We're called to be different than the society around us. And what's critical about this is the way we treat each other. And part of it is this conception of debt. In Matthew 18, Jesus picks up this idea of debt And he talks about a great king, and a servant of that great king comes up, and he owes an incredible debt. He cannot pay it, and so the king graciously, generously forgives the debt. That same servant goes out, he finds someone who owes him, and that person says, I can't pay. Instead of being gracious, the servant demands immediate payment, and then punishes that person to the fullest extent of the law because they couldn't pay. We're back in the same world of Deuteronomy 15 where the king acts generously and with grace, and the servant is ungracious and ungrateful. But Jesus wasn't talking about finances here. He was talking about forgiveness. We go into debt with each other all the time because of the way we treat each other. But what Deuteronomy 15 tells us, what Matthew 18 tells us, what the Lord's Prayer tells us is that there is a time limit on our debt. Verse 2, the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. And that's what Jesus said when he came and declared his kingdom. The time has come. The debt is paid. Forgiveness is here. And then he called us to forgive each other. And so that means that grace has to rule. It's one of the characteristics of who we are. The church is called to be a community. It's called to be a family that is defined by this incredible capacity to continue to forgive each other over and over again. It's hard. It's huge. It takes effort. 
but we can't escape it. The way we treat each other is an irreplaceable part of how we demonstrate Christ's kingdom to the world around us. So, is lack of forgiveness keeping you from going deeper with God's people? If so, you need to forgive or you need to seek forgiveness. We're all in this together. Now, our obligation, though, to each other goes into material things as well. James 2 reminds us, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is your faith? Now, at Central, we have official ways we care for each other. And the deacons are part of that. Deacons care for people in crisis. They visit people in hospitals. They send cards out to people. They give communion to shut-ins. They help people with financial crises. It's a thankless job, but it's one that we've got to remember to thank them for because it's an irreplaceable part of demonstrating who Jesus is to the world around us. And that's why we, every time we have communion, All of our cash offering goes to a special fund that the deacons use so that there will always be ample resources for this ministry of compassion. It's part of who we are called to be as God's people. It's not a missionary strategy. It's a kingdom reality. But it's not just the deacons. We're all called to help our brothers and sisters. This includes the people we see on the side of the road. It includes giving to our partner ministries. But it also includes being attentive to our neighbors, to our family, to the people in our networks. To bring that casserole or or order out for somebody when a family can't keep its normal schedule. It means sharing your connections. If somebody's out of a job, you extend yourself for them. It means sharing your expertise. If you can help them figure out how to deal with a particular problem. It might be child care that they need. And sometimes it's money. We're all called to an obligation of grace and compassion to each other. And it's going to take different shapes. And often it's just offering ourselves, offering our time to listen, to pray. Debbie uh, was talking to a neighbor years back, and I've shared this before, and the neighbor was so impressed with Ava Peran, who came and every week picked up her next door neighbor, our our friends in the neighborhood's neighbor, Miss Colleen. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, and it was done week after week faithfully. And this was not only a ministry to Central, this was not only a ministry to Miss Colleen, this was a ministry to our neighbor, because she saw Jesus, and she knew it, and she said it. So how are you getting deeper with God's people? Do you have any margin in your life for that? Maybe you're the one that needs help right now. And so take the opportunity to share that with someone. There's always a deacon available outside at the connection desk. We're all in this together. And this kind of deep friendship and loving community is just what our world needs right now when families are falling apart and committed friendships are so hard for people to live into. But we can't expect... We can't share things. We can't invite other people into an experience we don't have ourselves. So how are you going deeper with God's people? Just like last week after the service, I want to invite you to go out in the concourse, grab a cup of coffee and a marker, and this time, right on the window, your answer to the question, how are you connecting more deeply with others? And maybe we can learn from each other. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for 
your goodness to us. We thank you for the grace we receive that allows us to start over. Start over with you, have our sin forgiven. Start over when we haven't handled life well. And then we thank you for this table. That's a reminder of us that you have called us together in one people. There's no, there's no heroes in our life together. There are only people who need Jesus. And so as we receive that today, may we be attentive to Jesus. For we ask this in his name. Amen.